You're listening to the Struck Podcast. I'm Dan Blewett. I'm Alan Hall. And here on Struck, we talk about everything aviation, aerospace engineering, and lightning protection. All right, welcome back to the Struck Aerospace Engineering Podcast. I'm your co-host, Dan Blewett. On today's episode, uh, in our new segment, there's been a ton of, uh, unfortunately, animal strikes and actually a weird balloon strike, or at least what they think was a balloon, um, down in South America. So we're going to chat a little bit about that. Uh, in our engineering segment, we're going to talk about biofuel and Boeing potentially rolling this out uh, as an option or potentially with all their, uh, or at least with some of their planes in 2030. Um, and also a potential autonomous uh, wingman support aircraft being built over in the UK. Uh, and then lastly, on our EVTOS segment, we're going to talk about Joby. Uh, they're potentially going public in a SPAC. Um, a special purpose acquisition company, and uh, they might have some battery issues still. So we're going to talk about the uh, you know the the power reserves and the energy density, and whether that equation is still going to add up as they look to p- potentially go public and raise a lot of money to hopefully get to the finish line. And then lastly, uh, you know there's a Air One EVTOL hub that Hyundai is developing that's going to hopefully showcase some of the EV- EVTOL tech. And we'll talk about the very curious design of that uh, and some of the rendering. So, Alan, let's start with this this balloon. So, well, in addition to the balloon, there was a list of animals, the capybara, uh, some birds from a Delta flight in Tampa, a coyote strike, which coyotes are super cute. I know they're kind of a nuisance, but that makes me really sad. Um, and then another flock of birds in Istanbul. Um, but let's talk about this balloon I mean, that seems like that could be a really big problem. And that also seems to be really unusual. It is unusual. You don't hear about balloons running into aircraft all that often. But it, it's, it seems like the balloon hit the, basically the side of the airplane, got wrapped up in the engine and the tail and a bunch of plastic mm-hmm. everywhere, which is troubling from a safety standpoint because it can anything goes into an engine that's not <laughs> designed to be there is bad from from optimum engine performance uh so they could have lost an engine in theory and the the real question is is why was that balloon even there there's some discussion about whether it was sort of pyrotechnics related or uh some sort of hot air balloon uh measurement system something of the sort because it's unusual to to, to have balloons in your flight path if those things are you try to avoid doing that uh, so big safety risk, I think, and uh, we'll see what the regulators say about it and try to address it because it's like a lot of things right now, like all the drones and and all the being all the oversight being put on drones right now, and the, the whole oversight being put on drones is so you don't run into an aircraft and, and create an accident. In the meanwhile, <laughs> we hit a balloon and and uh, probably got lucky. Honestly, probably got lucky. Yeah, well, does it seem like occurrences are increasing or is it just the fact that everything in the whole world gets reported as news nowadays? Or obviously there's drones and there's more stuff in the air, like that's clear. But does it seem like it's increasing in prevalence or is it just front of mind? I think it gets reported more. There's there's incident reports and accident reports that are supposed to be filed when you have s- some significant safety issue. Let's just call it that way. Uh, and mm-hmm. and so if you and and today there's a lot of uh, websites that publicize that data. So as a part of the traveling public, if you've never flown an airplane that hit any birds or hit a coyote or run into a balloon, you don't really think about that. That happens quite often. It's a lot more than you think that it does. Uh, so aircraft damage from running into critters or running into into objects in flight is not unusual. It's actually a, a, a pretty common occurrence. Uh, even things like hail and bad weather, which can do a lot of damage to an aircraft really, really quickly, are, are pretty common. And there's a lot of repair stations and repair shops all around the world that that's all they do is fix aircraft parts and get them back in the air because they've hit something. So you just don't think about it as part of the traveling public. Like, today we're going to hit an elephant, you know, and, and uh, hopefully you don't. But it's it weird things happen and airplanes have to you know be repaired and be strong enough to sustain some of that like hitting an elephant would be bad but i guarantee you in the annals of aviation history someone's run into an elephant it's just as likely to happen so the one thing that stuck out to me is with the coyote strike they still sent it up to sixteen thousand square feet or square feet sixteen thousand feet of altitude and then 
doubled back and, and landed. Why did they, is that typical that, you know, you go that far and get that high before say, all right, we need to go get checked out? Or do they usually just continue on the flight? What's the typical protocol? Well, you, you may not have known that you've hit the animal because as a pilot of a multi-ton aircraft, if you hit a 50 pound coyote, yeah, you're probably not going to feel it. And what tends to happen is uh, one of the passengers points it out to a flight attendant saying, hey, I think we hit something and there's a dent in the wing or leading edge of the engine or something of the sort. Uh, and they tell the pilots, at that point, you may be at 10,000, 15,000 feet before the pilot can assess really what's going on. Obviously, it's not an immediate safety impact because you'd be all kinds of other bells and warnings going off. But still, it's hard to tell that you actually damage the aircraft because there's not there's no rear view mirrors in the airplane to look out the window to see some of the things like where the engines are sometimes it's hard to see that without really getting getting up looking and turning around to see if you can actually look out the windows and see those things uh yeah yeah so a lot of times uh if you've ever been on an airplane that has had a maintenance issue i've been on a couple of airplane flights where there's been maintenance issues where there's been loose latches on engine cowlings or uh, a loose uh, wing fairing of some sort. I, I can think of two off the top of my head. The way that the pilots get informed about it is that a passenger just says, there's something loose out there. We're missing some screws. <laughs> and then it's up to the pilot to decide what to do. Well, let's transition here into uh, our engineering segment. Let's talk about biofuels. So. Uh, Boeing is pledging to deliver uh, commercial air airplanes capable of flying on 100% biofuel or sustainable aviation fuel. I guess there's a, there's a difference by mm -hmm. 2030. That's only nine years away. I mean, everything, it seems like, is a really long timeline. Um, does that, uh, I have some more questions for you, but does that one strike you as realistic nine years from now? It's probably realistic. They still have to spend a significant amount of engineering time and test money to validate it and make sure that their the aircraft systems are ready for it. Uh, but it's not so much different from sort of standard Jet A in terms of its performance that it's going to be a huge shift. So it's a minor shift in the, in the fuel, the way the fuel is going to perform. But you still need to go through all the, all the performance issues. Does it provide the same amount of thrust? Does it you know, burn the same? Does it clog anything up? Does it get um, mold growing in it? All those variables. Does it damage uh, gaskets and filters and all these other things? There's a lot of little variables that they have to evaluate. So giving them a good solid five-year start is probably enough where you can then do some more flight testing and get to that point. But compared to what Airbus is doing, which is basically throughout everything we've known over the last 60, 70 years in terms of jet fuel, and go to hydrogen is a even a bigger risk. So it's sort of that risk reward. Boeing's taken the less risky path. Airbus has taken a much, much, much more risky path with hydrogen, I think. Yeah, well, and it says Boeing's successfully done this. So that in 2018 they had a, they had the first commercial flight, uh, went from Seattle to Memphis on a hundred percent biofuel uh, FedEx freighter, so seven seventy seven. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like this isn't too far off. So I guess maybe that is realistic, but I mean, the interesting thing with biofuels is there's a lot of rules about what's sustainable and what's not. Obviously, like, the, you know, with a lot of these alternative fuels, there's there's almost no point to some of them when you start to get beneath the surface. You're like, well, we have to, you know, deforest all this land to, pour, to plant more corn <laughs> to then make more ethanol to fuel our cars because ethanol is better. It's like, well, maybe, we should, you know, like, and then you have to transport. There's just like lots of logistics and supply chain. So they kind of stipulate that um, at least from a, a flight global report that mm -hmm. says you know hey like biofuel has no positive environmental impact if we have to be clearing land or if it's destroying forests or taking so much water or other energy to to produce this stuff so they're sure. specifying which makes sense that this needs to be sensible biofuel that actually helps the planet you know go in the right direction well i think aircraft in general have been going the right direction for a long time in terms of their efficiency the efficiency has only gotten better and substantially better over the last 30 to 40 years with the advent of electronic engine controls and uh the the computers used to design aircraft they've just gotten so much more efficient i th i think and 
I think relatively speaking, the number of aircraft versus the number of cars on the road, it's like a thousand to one. So there's about a, a thousand cars versus every aircraft that's out there today in terms of general aviation population. In terms of commercial aircraft, like you and I would fly on like 737 type aircraft, there's probably around 8,000 aircraft in the United States right now versus about almost 300 million cars on the road. So relatively speaking, you know, how much time and effort you're going to put into a biofuel situation versus a car situation, right? You're probably going to work mm -hmm. on cars first, airplanes second. Well, and so the other uh, interesting thing in our engineering segment here today is uh, this uncrewed combat aircraft uh, that's uh, getting some funding over in the UK. And it's essentially going to, they're calling it sort of like a loyal wingman where this would fly autonomously next to fighter jets um, with its own, you know, armaments and be just like a little sidekick. I mean, right. <laughs> that seems crazy. And obviously we covered some of the DARPA stuff earlier this year using AI, you know, the way they're trying to see how well an AI um, pilot could do, you know, as a, as a dog fighter in one of these fighter jets. But this seems like a pretty cool concept. I mean, how does this, how does this strike you? This, this wingman concept? It's like something out of the transformer movies. If you've ever watched a transformer movie, be forced to watch a transformer movie. It seems like it's right out of that sort of science. Well, the fiction. cartoons were amazing. They were my childhood. Yeah. <laughs> cartoons were cartoons amazing. Cartoons are fine. The, the movies, movies were just like, I, I can't do it. Yeah. <laughs> but the, yeah. the, the concept of having a, a human piloted aircraft, that is supported by one or more uh, drone aircraft that also have arms on them it has been discussed for a number of years. And I know the United States has really progressed down that pathway and there's a lot of development. The first time I heard of it was probably 2000, where something was real and they were trying to build hardware. It was probably around 2002 or three. It was almost 20 years ago. Uh, when those first little inklings started popping up in the United States. And so now with the computer technology we have and all the advanced aerodynamics um, and st stealthiness features you can build into those aircraft, it's a really interesting concept. I'm just not sure how it's going to play out because why do you need the human powered aircraft? You know what I mean? Like if I, if I can send a drone aircraft around the world, which you can do today, then what's with the piloted aircraft? Wouldn't everything just be essentially a robot plane? Am I yeah. wrong? Don't you think that's where we're going? They're going to have robot. This, we're getting to like this, this Terminator type event where it's robot wars. It seems like it because you can do it. Well, you're right. It does. It does beg the question: If we can have this other little baby plane next to it, why not have just two baby planes and no no human plane? Right. Or just full size planes. You're right that it isn't clear why you would need the human plane. Right. Especially as the, as the AI gets good enough where it's like, well, it can make better decisions than the human can. So there's literally no point well, except for preventing them from getting smarter and then again, overthrowing us and then enslaving <laughs> us, which is they were obviously the natural progression to all of this. Yeah. We're in the Terminator scenario again. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> yep. Well, I'm Bla I watched Blade Runner 2049 again this past weekend oh, yeah. and he's he always lands with his cop car yep. and the little... You know, the whether that's his sidekick or it's more of like his recon drone, right? Kind of like scans the environment for him and takes photographs and all that stuff. But uh, that obviously seems like it has great applications. But uh, but yeah, at, at, a, at a certain point, it's like, we'll just replace the human. Right. So the, the, the work they're doing when, over in the UK, and that's going to be focused in, uh, which is now Spirit Belfast, which is, I think, Spirit Aerostructures. I think it's what they're calling that division. The, the Belfast Division of Spirit has plenty of capability to make those aircraft. There is not a question in my mind. It seems like it's a basically a Kickstarter program where they're going to put some funding towards initial design concepts and working out tooling and the factory layout, those kind of fundamental things you want to do up front. Uh, but there, there's an intent there in terms of at least the UK government to sustain the aerospace business in Belfast, which is good. All right, moving on to our EVTOL segment. Uh, first up, let's talk about the world's first EVTOL hub is in the works. The Air One, which is a British government sponsored um, Hyundai and Urban Airport have gotten approval to start building this. Yeah, it looks um, 
kind of like C-3PO, like the very top of him or the top of the uh, the space shuttle. It's very, it's like a little elevated dome with a platform for the, the, the aircraft to sit on. And there's bleachers for, you know, participants to be maimed in case anything goes wrong. <laughs> They're very, you know, <laughs> definitely close enough to be maimed if something yeah. happens. Um, but it seems like SeaWorld for aircraft is kind of the way I would describe it. But <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, what is the point of this just to get people excited about it, or is this just for press press release, press conferences kind of? I mean, yeah. how does this strike you? It seems kind of strange to me. It is because there's very little consideration of overall safety. You know, the reason you can't walk along a runway is because they don't want people to die there, and they don't let you park at the ends of runways typically for the same reason. And it's just the concepts are really cool, and the colors are great, and uh, it's, it's there to help fundraise and get investors, I'm sure. But the fact of the matter is it will never look like that. Not, not ever. Uh, because the number one important, most important thing about any sort of travel is safety. And some of these uh, visions of the future, uh, like in this particular case, where they show like 500 people sitting around watching this airplane land and take off <laughs> within, I don't know, probably 100 feet. It's pretty close. Uh, that's just not smart. Yeah. That's just not smart. But, I, you know, the one thing that is really odd about the eVTOL is that why do you need a dedicated place? I'm curious because we don't, helicopters don't all the time. Uh, you know, a lot yeah, of, they can land true. on a field. Um, you can land on a piece of asphalt, a parking lot. You know, some places mostly clear, right? You don't run into your light poles or, or, uh, power cables or anything and that sort of thing. You you want a clean area, but there's a lot of clean areas to land, I think. And airports are in congestion air, in places. Airports are a good place to land because they're monitored and there's some level of safety. You're not going to run into another aircraft. All those things are going on. So I'm just not sure what the desire is to create and spend literally billions of dollars to create a helipad. I don't get it. Do you I mean, do you understand it, Dan? I, I just don't see where people will care. It's yeah, it seems like it's almost like they're just trying to build buzz and you're right. At the end of the day, it's an industrial machine that needs to just land and take off and <laughs> right. put people from point A to point B, but they want to make it this big like community space as if you're going to like land in your EVTOL and then walk out and like there's a grass and a picnic table right there and you can like you know, have a mojito and wait for your next flight. Like that doesn't seem realistic. No. Yeah. That doesn't happen today. Because they don't have that on, yeah, not on rooftops where a helicopter's landing. It's like no. just blank concrete and that's that. Right. And I think that the most, well, in the, in the United States, I think in Brazil, there is a, there is a, a really a viable market to hop from building to building. I think Sao Paulo is one of those places where that happens. But in the United States, it really doesn't happen all that much. Even in Los Angeles, I think they have restrictions on helicopters because of the noise. So I'm just, the whole concept of this is really not playing out the way that I think it should yet. The, the eVTOL designs, and you know, first of all, eVTOL designs are still, I think, marginal at best. We haven't really seen any of them fly and meet any design specs yet. And then to start designing <laughs> landing spots seems a little too far out in front. Yeah, agreed. Well, so let's jump to Joby here. So there's reports they're looking to go public uh, in a SPAC deal. So I guess SPACs are like the hot thing this year, which these special acquisition companies grab, uh, sort of just like envelop a company and then we're going to take it public and they're going to raise a bunch of money. Um, you know, does that seem like they're running from something like they really need a lot more money than I mean they're already very well funded but as you've said a number of times it takes a staggering amount of money to produce a, a viable aircraft and then make your investment or make your return on your investment back right so I mean how does this this news with Joby strike you well it's it's a another indicator that you're going to need a billion dollars to create one of these aircraft that's what it's saying is that if they're trying to fundraise off of roughly the $800 million they have already secured, at least on some level secured. The only reason you do a SPAC is to increase that that investment. That's the only reason you would do it. 
And so, mm-hmm. so if they're looking for a billion, billion plus to build this aircraft, man, that's a lot of money. That's a huge risk now. And if, if you can think about it this way, Dan, if you're trying to design something really pushing the envelope, and then you have to find investors for it and keep all these balls in the air at one time, it's easy to start dropping balls and the whole thing collapses. All it takes is one misstep mm-hmm. and it can all collapse. So I'm starting to feel like because you have so much risk, downside risk, there's going to be a lot of um, institutional investors sh- starting to drive that company a little bit more and leaving the engineering engineers to do the engineering piece of it and the investment group, bankers, whoever, to manage the money. Because it's just, there's a lot of money to be playing around with here. And literally, this whole program can go away with one or two accidents early on. Yeah. It could. Yeah. Well, and you still think there's battery issues, right? I mean, that's... Yeah, I think, Dan, if you, if you start running the numbers and looking at what is how much energy is going to take to do the, the 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 cruise speeds and the range in which you're talking about with the number of peak passengers uh, it's going to be close it's going to be really close and it isn't like some of these designs and Joby is one of them where you could modularly add on a battery pack at least that's not what's envisioned right now i haven't seen any indication of that but if you can't make range or you can't make speeds, you're going to have to do something. If the weight is what the weight is because you have four people plus some some amount of luggage or carrying on things, uh, mm. there's just a lot of mass to move there. And I don't think the battery technology is quite there yet. The energy density is not quite high enough to do what they think they're going to do. So either there's going to be some unique flight characteristics of the aircraft where the <laughs> you know, uh, there's a lot of different ways to, to, to answer that problem. But I don't know if they're going to have a lot of a lot of margin in this event in terms of the design. There's not a lot of error you can have. It doesn't take take much for the airplane to go overweight. It doesn't take a lot for the airplane not to make maximum airspeed. Drags too high. And those slight variations can really sink a program fast. And I've watched probably my lifetime, a hundred aircraft programs collapse just because of that. Not with a billion dollars with way less money, but that's why I say the risk reward, you're going to have to fly this thing through a keyhole <laughs> in terms of the design to get to the other side. And it, it's just starting to feel a little precarious, I think right now. All right. Well, that'll do it for today's episode of Struck. If you're new to the show, thank you so much for listening and please leave a review and subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Check out the WeatherGuard Lightning Tech YouTube channel for video episodes, full interviews, and short clips from the show. And follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Our handle is at WG Lightning. Tune in next Tuesday for another great episode on aviation, aerospace engineering, and lightning protection. Strike Tape, WeatherGuard Lightning Tech's proprietary lightning protection for radomes, provides unmatched durability for years to come. If you need help with your radome lightning protection, reach out to us at weatherguardaero.com. That's weatherguardaero.com.